Uh, we are honored to have, all the way in from California, Derek Cressman. Derek began working professionally to reduce big money in politics in 1995 with such nonpartisan organizations as Common Cause and Public Interest Research Group. As U.S. Perg's Democracy Program Director, he was the first professional advocate in Washington to support a constitutional amendment to limit campaign spending. As director of Common Cause's Amend 2012 campaign, Derek was the architect behind voter instruction measures in Montana, Colorado, Massachusetts, and California, where voters demand Congress pass an amendment to overturn the Supreme Court's Citizens United ruling. He's the author of When Money Talks, the high price of free speech and the selling of democracy. Please welcome Derek Cressman. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. Uh, it is really cool to be here. Um, and I don't mean cold cool, because it's actually, you did a great job heating the tent and we got all these folks in here. But by cool, I mean, I, I was realizing on my way to this event that the last time I was in Manchester, New Hampshire was almost exactly 20 years ago. I had just taken this job on a campaign called Americans Against Political Corruption. And I came up here from Washington, D.C., and with one volunteer, we went around and bird-dogged presidential candidates with our little sign that said, Americans Against Political Corruption, and tried to get them to sign on to a five-point platform that included, even back then, a, a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. And it did uh, bear some fruit. By the end of that campaign, we had a Republican from Ohio and a Democrat from Virginia who introduced a constitutional amendment to establish that unlimited campaign spending was not free speech. But I gotta tell you, almost nobody noticed. Not a single presidential candidate that year mentioned money in politics in New Hampshire or so far as I could tell in any of their stump speeches. And Look at uh, what a difference 20 years make. Uh, not just one volunteer, me, but we had a whole tent full of people and a whole army of people walking across town here in New Hampshire because we're mad and we're ready to take action. And this is not just an issue in the presidential debate, but boy, it seemed like Saturday night it was the number one issue that candidates wanted to talk about. And that's what gives me hope that we're gonna prevail. So. Um, that campaign, as I said, Americans Against Political Corruption, we were trying to expand the idea of corruption from a quid pro bribe to say that the whole political system is corrupt. And I still think that that's true and that's a useful way to talk about the issue, but I wanna suggest today one different way of thinking about the issue in addition and one different tactic than some of the ones you may be familiar with. Um, but let me start first by thanking you for taking your time to come here today. Um, you know, I know we all have incredibly busy lives and our time is scarce. You know, uh, most of us work and you, you go to the office and you've got way more things to do in a day than you have time in the work day. We've got sick kids to take care of. We have chores to do at home. Many of you probably should be doing chores right now on the weekend, but you came to a political event. We like to eat, we need to get sleep. Our email inboxes are overflowing, our voicemails are overflowing, and still we need to take some time to figure out how to vote, to pay attention to politics. But that time is limited. So I thank you for coming, not only because I do sincerely value the fact that you came here today, but this is a key point that I raise in the book. The fact that our time is incredibly scarce means that we limit the amount of time that we spend to politics, and we limit our political speech all of the time. One classic example is you go to a city council meeting, or I bet here in New England every year you have a whole town meeting where the whole town gets together and figures out what they're gonna do with their budget th that year. And at least where I live in Sacramento and most city councils across the country, each person can say anything they want during a public comment period, but only for one minute or only for two minutes. We limit our time so that everybody has a chance to speak. We do the same thing on the floors of Congress. If you watch C-SPAN, they spend a lot of time arguing about how much the gentleman from Virginia has left time to yield to the gentlewoman from Florida. Uh, we limit time on the, on the Supreme Court itself. When they hear oral arguments, they will tell each time, uh, side they have 30 minutes to present their case and no more. And when the time's expired, they limit 
the speech. They limit the page briefs, too. There's a funny story in the book about what happened to BP Oil when they tried to cheat on these limits by using a smaller font size. The judge said no, no, and practically threw them out of court because we want to ensure that judges and legislators and city councilors make fair decisions and wise decisions by hearing information from all sides of an issue. Um, and you know, you would think this is common sense, but it turns out I've, I've realized this is a learned behavior, and we learn it in kindergarten. You know, I, I was volunteering at my daughter's school, it was actually in first grade, and you walk into a room full of first graders, and you realize nobody can be heard because everybody is talking at once. And the teacher spends the bulk of first grade teaching you how to sit down, be quiet, raise your hand, and calls on people one at a time. The teacher is limiting speech so that other people can be heard. I can tell you've all been to kindergarten because you're all sitting there very quietly and politely, not talking, listening to me talk, because this is how we have civil discourse in our country. But I'm beginning to think that five of the members of the Supreme Court must have never gone to kindergarten, because this seems to be a totally foreign concept to them. Um, but imagine for a minute what it would be like if we didn't learn these lessons and that you could walk into your city council meeting or your annual New England town hall meeting and walk up to the podium and say, I've got $10,000 right here. I'd like to buy an hour's worth of time. Yeah. I know that everybody else gets two minutes, but money is speech and I'd like to buy an hour's worth of time. Now, nobody would think that that was reasonable. And if the parliamentarian said, well, I'm going to allow them to do that as long as they take the paper bag off their head and let us know who they are, no one would think that that was an adequate solution. Um, and debating about whether or not this person speaking for an hour corrupted any of the members of the city council, I think, is the wrong question to ask, right? You might have one member of the council go, well, I agreed with the guy before he walked in, so I'm voting that way, but his $10,000 had no influence on me. And that might be perfectly true. And you might have another member of the council going, well, I disagreed with this person before they walked in, and I'm going to vote against them, and that proves that I'm not corrupted by the $10,000. But the problem is this person droning on for an hour is squelching the voice of everybody else because you're not getting to hear from them. And that makes for a dumber decision-making process. Um, now, if our parliamentarian ruled that, I think the first response that everybody would do is, you gotta fire the parliamentarian. Clearly that's crazy to allow one person to speak way more than others. Um, and if that didn't work, maybe we would say, all right, well, nobody else here has $10,000, but we'll use public funds to give everybody an hour to speak so they can keep up with the billionaires. And that would make things more fair. And it would arguably be the right thing to do. In fact, I absolutely support public financing of campaigns. But what we might wind up with is 100 hours of political speech then. And what would most people in the audience do? They'd go home. You're not going to sit in the meeting for 100 hours. You'd see the city councilors kind of whipping out their cell phone, you know, checking their email and posting on Facebook. And in effect, everybody's speech would become less meaningful because the forum would be saturated. You may have experienced this in New Hampshire over the last week. Anyone here tried to make a phone call to a neighbor or knock on their door and talk to them about politics? Say, hey, I've got a presidential candidate I really care about. You want to hear me speak? Slam, right? Um, people are saturated with information about the presidential race now. They've made up their minds, and that actually makes it very difficult for anyone to speak to them about that. Because, so the money that has inundated has silenced the speech of everyone else. Now, the Supreme Court just doesn't seem to get this. They said 40 years ago, almost to this day, in the Buckley versus Vallejo ruling that struck down our post-Watergate reforms, that it is wholly foreign to the First Amendment to limit the speech of one person in order to enhance the relative voice of another. And yet, as I just pointed out, we do this all the time. And some of them, in thinking about it, might respond, well, 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 that's different because there's a roof over the head of the Supreme Court and Congress. When you're in a building, when you're in a forum, we limit speech because we, Supreme Court justices, we have hundreds of cases to hear. We would have to limit the amount of each case, so of course we limit speech. But 
if you take off the roof, there can be no limits. And yet, I don't think that's true. I think that's the key faulty assumption in how our courts have looked at money and politics. And in fact, if you look at the experiences of real people outside of the building, we limit their speech all the time. Um, that's a protester from 99 Rise, and they limited her speech by hauling her to jail because they thought she'd spoken too much. I had the same thing happen to me when I did a protest with them in Sacramento after a march up from Washington, D.C. Perhaps some of you have had this happen to you. I was staying in Portland a few days ago, uh, and a friend put me up in his house and showed me a picture where he'd put a sign on top of his house that says, End Corporate Rule. About a week later, he gets a citation from the city of Portland fining him $50 a day unless he takes down this speech, which is in violation of a sign ordinance in Portland. Right? We limit speech outside of buildings all of the time, too. And I would actually argue that this speech didn't make it into my book, so I put it into some free bonus chapters that you can get if you go to the website uh, whenmoneytalks.com. But I think we have gone too far in limiting the speech of real people all the time, right? Like, talk to the folks who led the Occupy movement in Zuccotti Park, or even the folks in Eamon Bundy's group who are occupying federal lands in Oregon right now, and police moved in to limit their speech. We were tired of what they were saying, and we were saying somewhat legitimate, look, this is a public space, other people want to use this to watch birds or enjoy the park or whatnot. We're going to limit your speech. Now, I think in some of those examples, certainly Tom's house, uh, we've gone too far. But I do understand the notion that we are living in a society of information overload. You know, one edition of the New York Times today contains more information than uh, someone living in Thomas Jefferson's day would have encountered in their entire lifetimes. Um, and the sane response to this information overload is to pick and choose the information that's most important to you, right? So you've got a spam filter on your email, so all your junk goes there. You've got a delete button on your voicemail. You've got a mute button on your TV remote. And yet, um, what we're finding, Clay Shirky, information guru, he says, yeah, there's actually no such thing as information overload, only filter failure. And there are cognitive scientists who've actually looked into this, and they find that the human brain can hold about five to seven pieces of information in its head at any given moment. You know, that's your computer RAM, if you will. If you're a really good computer, you got seven. If you're like me, maybe it's more like five. But it's a fixed amount of information. So when a new piece of information comes in, it is displacing another piece of information. Um, so it's a, it becomes a zero-sum game as information pushes information out. And then the key question is, is who's going to decide what information you want to listen to out of the hundreds of megabytes of information that you're inundated with every day? And I don't think we want the government making that choice, right? Ted Cruz has gone to the floor of the US Senate and said, well, we don't want a situation where the government can throw the producers of Saturday Night Live in jail uh, for political speech. And I agree with him. But uh, we'll get to the point where I disagree with them in a minute. So we don't want the government limiting speech, but I also don't think we want advertisers deciding what we hear and don't hear. And that is really the essence of advertising, is to disrupt our information filters. Um, what we want is for you, the voter, to be able to decide what information is important to you and what isn't, and for you to be able to set up your own information filters and this means I think we need to think about speech a little bit differently than we've talked about it in the campaign finance. Because there, really, there are two kinds of speech. The first one that I call free speech is information that you seek out through the free press. You buy a newspaper, the New York Times. You tune in to Saturday Night Live because you want to watch it. You see a movie. Maybe you want to see Hillary the movie made by the Citizens United organization or a Michael Moore movie, but you're seeking out that speech. Contrast that to paid speech that you're not seeking out and someone is paying money to interrupt the speech that you wanted to see. That's a line that we can draw and it makes um, 
the, the legal arguments around this much more clear, because I think we want no limits on the free speech that you seek out as a listener, but not a ban on paid speech, but limits there that the amount that anyone can contribute. And I think fundamentally, um, while we need to change the way we fund campaigns and have campaigns to the extent we need them to rely on small contributions from real people and public financing, we need to also think about how heavily we rely on paid campaigns in the first place. I mean, think about it. When you buy a car, do you do that based on the really cool advertisement where they're driving down the curvy road, 30-second TV ad? Or do you buy Car and Driver or Consumer Reports where you pay for the speech from an objective source of information or ask a friend how they like their car or go take a test drive? I think we've become far too reliant on the belief that the only way we can inform ourselves about candidates is through having them use paid speech and 30-second TV ads instead of us taking the responsibility to seek that out through newspapers, magazines, and whatnot. So, while I like public financing of candidate campaigns, I'd love to see public financing of free broadband internet service for every person in America so they have the opportunity to seek out their own information from sources that they find credible. Let's have tax credits for newspaper and magazine contributions as well. Let's require um, TV stations to um, live up to their public interest obligations and cover news and candidates in addition to selling us ads. Now, the Supreme Court won't let us do any of these things. We all know this, this is why we're here. So there are three ways that we can address this, um, all of which I think are valid, the first two of which you've probably heard about. We could wait for a new court. We have presidential candidates marching around this state right now saying, if I'm elected president, I will use a litmus test and only put justices on the court who would overturn Citizens United. I, I think it's proper they're doing that. I think we should support the ones who are doing that and encourage others to make the same pledge. Um, but it's ultimately a bit of an uncertain proposition because we have four justices that may be retiring or otherwise leaving the court in the next four to 10 years. But we don't know for sure when that will happen. We don't know for sure who they'll be replaced by. And even more troubling to me, we don't know for sure that in 20 or 25 years, they won't be replaced by somebody else and the pendulum could keep switching back every 10 or 20 years in 5-4 votes on whether or not money is free speech. I don't think that's a way to take our Constitution seriously or to take self-government seriously. I mean, the, the patriots who founded our country, they didn't go, well, King George sucks, but we could just wait around for a new king, right? The new king might be better. Um, and he might have been, but they decided, no, we want to govern ourselves through a republic and not have a king be a supreme being over us. And I worry that we are sliding away from that and allowing the Supreme Court to govern us as a council of nine supreme beings over we the people. So let me uh, look, talk about the second way to overturn a Citizens United ruling. We've heard a lot about it today, something I absolutely support. We could pass a constitutional amendment. This was the guarantee that George Washington gave to us in his farewell address about what it means to live in a republic that you can alter or amend your constitution. And I get really troubled when I hear people say, that's just too hard. If it's now become too hard for 80% of the country to amend the constitution, to run things the way that we want to, and we need to capitulate to five unelected judges, I think we've lost George Washington's promise, and we've lost the republic. So I, that to me is as fundamental or even more so than the threat of money in politics is the threat of judicial rule and the undermining of democracy. So I suggest we also look at a third way to deal with this problem, and this is the approach that was used by Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he had a Supreme Court that was throwing out every bit of the New Deal that he passed in his first four years in office. And he was genuinely frightened about the future of the country and feeling that we could lose the republic, just the way I am frightened right now and feeling we are losing the republic. Some people said he should pass a constitutional amendment to overturn these Supreme Court rulings. He worried that would take too long. So what he did, he, he ran his re-election campaign against the court. He said, I think they're wrong, I think I'm right, vote for me. 
And he won overwhelmingly. And he used that mandate to spur a constitutional crisis where he looked the Supreme Court in the eye and made them blink. And the way he did this, people think it was a failure, but I contend it was the single greatest success of his presidency. He threatened to pack the Supreme Court and say, nothing magic about nine justices on the court. I'm going to add a few more. This freaked him out. This was a direct assault at the institutional power of nine unelected judges. And a guy named Owen Roberts on that court, no relation to John Roberts, he flipped his vote. And it was known as the switch in time that saved nine, meaning he switched his vote just in time to save the number nine justices on the court. And I think we need our next president to figure out a way to use similar executive leadership to stare down the United States Supreme Court. They could appoint real people, real reformers, on the Federal Elections Commission who would enforce our existing campaign finance laws in defiance of the Supreme Court. We've heard several Republican candidates espouse this idea, saying, if I'm elected, I'm not going to feel bound by decisions of the Supreme Court. And that's a proposition that scares many of us, and we've actually seen this used in a kind of dangerous way in our past, when, for example, the governor of Arkansas said, I'm going to defy federal court rulings to desegregate our schools. And the governor, of our, uh, the president of the United States said, no, you're not. I'm going to send in federal troops to enforce the US Supreme Court ruling. I don't know if we'd have an executive branch that would send in federal troops to enforce the Citizens United ruling. Um, but to me, the check and balance on runaway executive power then needs to be, it can only be justified when it's done on behalf of we the people. So FDR, I think, had a pretty good claim that he was acting on behalf of we the people because he just won an election. But how do we know today if someone has a similar mandate? And I suggest we start using a tool that was used by our founders to demonstrate that. And we've heard a little bit about it already, where in 2012, voters in Montana and Colorado put instruction questions on the ballot to say, in no uncertain terms, we instruct our elected officials to overturn the Supreme Court in Citizens United. 75% of them agreed. We have similar questions on the ballot now in Washington State and likely California. I think we'll see similar results. That, to me, starts looking like a national mandate for the executive branch to say, I am certain I am acting on behalf of the people. But if we don't feel like it's a strong enough mandate, Congress could, by a majority vote, place a national voter instruction on our ballots all across the country and give the entire country, we the people, the chance to weigh in. And I contend after a vote like that, any president would be justified in standing up to the Supreme Court and enforcing our campaign finance laws. So that's a new tactic that I suggest, not as an alternative to the dozens of other things that we need to be doing, but as another one to throw into the mix. And let me just wrap it up and then throw it open to questions with some final things about what you can do. If you want to learn more about these ideas, there's a book uh, on that table back there. Happy to get it to you now. You can also get it later through Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever you get your books. I appreciate the fact that you've taken 15, 30 minutes to listen to this today. I'm going to beg you to spend four or five hours and read this book, knowing that your time is scarce, knowing that your time is precious. But I think these are important tools for us to, um, to learn about. Um, there are some bonus chapters available for free that I mentioned before. Um, and finally, I'd say, well, I love the ideas in my book. Do whatever idea seems right to you. You know, people are pushing for public financing. They're pushing for disclosure. They're pushing to end gerrymandering. It is not an either or proposition. It is an all of the above proposition. And not some things now and some things later, but every possible thing that we can think of right here, right now, because our situation is that dear, dire. But don't let anyone tell you because it's dire, it can't be done. You know, in, in my lifetime, I've seen the Berlin Wall fall. I've seen Nelson Mandela freed in South Africa. Uh, in our country's lifetime, we've seen women get the right to vote, the right to vote for US senators, the end of slavery, huge advances. And I contend that these advances happen very, very quickly after building up for decades, much like an earthquake 
the pressure on the plate tectonics can build for 30, 40, 50 years, and it looks like nothing moves. But then when it breaks, we see very big changes very quickly. I think we may be on the cusp of some of these very big changes. I think we have lined up a whole agenda of things that we need to push through in that very brief window of time that we will have. And I applaud and thank all of you for your dedication in this movement and your willingness to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Join me in thanking, join me in thanking Derek Cressman, again, all the way in from California. Do check out his book. It's there at the back. I'm sure you'd be willing to sign some copies. Great. Thank you so much.